I've been considering upgrading to the Sony A9 Mark III, and Sony was nice enough to lend me one to evaluate before making the decision. There are a lot of other videos covering the headline, features, and specs of the A9 Mark III, so I'm not going to go into all of that here. Instead, I'm really just going to go into the things that I wanted to know about the camera that I just didn't see covered anywhere else. This is going to be mainly from the perspective of a wedding photographer who currently shoots with Sony cameras, in my case the A1, and is curious about how the A9 III compares. At these core we shoot hybrid stills and video, quickly switching between the two formats on a wedding day. For that reason we don't usually use log, we typically shoot 120p most of the time, and we constantly break the 180 degree shutter rule. We are not cinematographers, we are photographers first and foremost, and our video use is generally limited to little highlight reels secondary to our photography. I also don't often use flash and I prefer to use available light as often as possible, so I really didn't test out the flash sync benefits of the global shutter. I have been running into an increasing number of venues with problematic flickering LED lighting, and I really mostly was interested in testing how the global shutter handles these scenarios, so I'll be devoting a good chunk of this video to that aspect of the A9 III. The A9 III had plenty of surprises, so let's start off with the good surprises. First of all, the ergonomics. Sony has put so much attention into the physical ergonomics of the camera. I mean, every dial has this perfectly tuned, satisfying click. Every button has this deep, plump, springy level of travel. The shutter button just like naturally falling under your index finger. No more pinky finger without a place to rest. Sony really went to great lengths here to flip the scripts on the past use of the term Sony ergonomics. As a wedding photographer, I have my camera in my hands for sometimes 12 hours a day, and that adds up to hundreds of hours over the course of a season. Another pleasant surprise was the AF and AI chip, and just how much heavy lifting those two do. You know, I really underestimated just how intuitive the AI subject recognition is and how well it works in tandem with the AF system. In the A9, I mean, it actually made going back to the A1 feel like more work, which is crazy because I never felt like the A1 was lacking in AF in any regard, especially when it comes to people focus. I wasn't gonna drag out the Atomos and do, you know, this sort of comparison on a wedding day, but I think the best way to demonstrate this is with this shot of my son. Well, he works on his little 3D printing project here. With the A1, you can see that with his face partially obscured by his hat, it never really finds his face or eye. Switching to the A9 though, I mean it literally has no problem finding him and when his eye is visible it just locks right onto it, no issues. So when it comes to AF consistency, the A1, I mean it's fantastic, but I do expect to see the very odd, very occasional slightly missed focus shot and we're talking like maybe one out of every 50 or even 100 shots, but with the A9 it just, not a single image missed. The entire day, none. Every single shot where there's a person in the frame has a person's eye absolutely perfect in focus. And I've never seen this, never seen it in a camera before until now. So another pleasant surprise with the A9 Mark III was the image stabilization. I mean, I already knew from the specs that the image stabilization had been improved over the A1 from like 5.5 EV to now 8 EV, but I just, I have to admit, this one spec that wasn't even really on my radar until I got to try the camera. I didn't realize just how much of an improvement the image stabilization would be until trying it in person, especially with longer lenses like my 135. The image stabilization was so good that some of my 120p video shots look almost eerily like still shots if there's not enough subject movement in the scene. So, I mean, this never really happened with the A1, at least not in my hands. While I was on the wedding, I noticed that if there were multiple faces detected and I was in wide area autofocus, uh, the camera would show a little orange line under the selected subject. You know, I, again, I didn't want to explore this too much on the wedding day because that's not the time to be playing around with things you're not familiar with. But uh, when I got back to the studio, I actually discovered that I could use the joystick to jump to other detected faces in a scene. So this is the only one thing that I can think of that Sony's been missing in their cameras until now. I haven't seen this mentioned anywhere else, and I know this is something that a lot of Sony users have been asking for for years. Of course, at the time of making this video, my A1 is kind of currently in a firmware purgatory state as it's been recently updated to firmware version 2.0, which has been withdrawn. 
uh, and is no longer available. But I, I did check to see if Sony added the ability to use the joystick to jump to other faces on the A1, and sadly they did not. It's a little bit of a bummer because it's a really cool feature and it's, it, like I said, it's really the last thing I could think of that could really be added to fully complete Sony's AF system and they have done it here in the A9. Okay, so let's talk about the image quality of the camera. So looking strictly at the sensor performance, um, I'm not gonna get into the dynamic range because we already know that it has a base ISO of 250 instead of 100, and that you lose that benefit of the peak dynamic range accordingly. Um, as for high ISO noise levels, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of other internet reviewers and personalities making comments to the effect that the A93 has a performance akin to that more of an APS-C sensor rather than a modern full frame. I mean, this would have been a big disappointment, but I'm happy to report that any notion that the A93 is more like an APS-C in terms of performance, I mean, that's complete nonsense. How do I know this? Simple, I took the A9 Mark III, the A1 and the A7C, which is also a 24 megapixel full frame Sony with very reputable noise performance. I set up a scene where I had a manual strobe for lighting so that Nothing would move around as far as lighting's concerned. I took the same shots on all three cameras using the exact same lens and the same settings. And when I import the files into Lightroom, there is essentially little to no difference between the three cameras as far as noise levels are concerned at ISO 64 and 12,800. Taking the A1 files and converting them to a 24 megapixel DNG, this gets rid of any uh, resolution advantages and differences in A1, so it's a more fair comparison. Uh, there really isn't anything between the, the two cameras as far as noise is concerned. Having said all that, I did kind of miss the ability to crop in the way I do on the A1, but overall the A93 image quality felt like I really wasn't taking a hit versus the A1. So this is a really good surprise because with all of the headlines out there and the, the talk of the global shutter coming with an image quality hit, you know, I really just didn't see that. To me, it's pretty clear. The camera, especially when it comes to low light, IS, high ISO, low light, um, it performs up there with basically any modern current full frame. I do shoot exclusively with fast primes and the 50 millimeter f1.2, that's my bread and butter lens. I shoot with it a lot. And one thing I love about my A1 is being able to shoot at f1.2 on a sunny day because the shutter speeds can go all the way up to 1 32,000th of a second. The A9 Mark III has a max shutter speed of 1 80,000th of a second, but with a base ISO of 250, that 80,000th of a second really is the same as exposure equivalent to the A1 with its 32,000th of a second at ISO 100. There is another caveat, which really became an issue for me. When using any aperture faster than f1.8, the A9 Mark III limits the max shutter speed to 1 16,000th of a second for some reason. With that ISO base of 250, I found that, you know, I was hitting that exposure ceiling much more often than anticipated. I ended up swapping my 50 mil for the 135 millimeter f1.8 for the rest of the shoot on the A9 Mark III. And, and that worked out better. I'm not sure why the A9 Mark III has this shutter speed limitation, but I mean, there must be some technical reason. Some people have said to me that Sony have a firmware update planned to remove the 16,000th of a second shutter limit. But I mean, that's only true for burst modes. That's, that's actually not true for apertures. So this limitation does have me pausing as far as considering upgrading to the A9 Mark III. Really, that was kind of the only negative uh, surprise it was was just how often I was running into that that limitation with the shutter speed at f1.2 uh, So now the thing I really wanted to try out was the global shutter and how it handles LED lighting As I mentioned at the beginning of the video We've been running into an increasing number of venues with problematic flickering lighting This lighting is a problem for both stills and for video. I'm gonna try to avoid getting too technical here, but I mean, it does help to understand flicker rates and how flicker rates affect digital stills and video and why the global shutter had our hopes up as the solution. So first off, the flicker rate of LED lighting can vary anywhere from just under 60 Hertz here in North America, all the way up to thousands of Hertz. We don't see it with our eyes, but we do see it in photos and video. In many cases, it's one of the most ruinous, challenging, and just limiting factors that we deal with on a regular basis. But this gets complicated when there are multiple flickering light sources with 
different timing and or flicker rates in a given situation. It becomes even more complicated when there is changing or dynamic flickering light sources, such as like cycling RGB lighting. At weddings, we see all of this and it seems like there's just no limit to the challenge that different lights will present at different weddings and you know, the better tools we have to mitigate it and deal with this and handle these situations, the, the better we are. So I didn't get to stress test the global shutter on a wedding during my time with the A9 Mark III, but I do have a set of string lights that mimics the absolute most problematic venue lighting that we ever come across. I mean, these things flicker at just under 60 hertz. This is the absolute worst case lighting scenario. It's the most limiting for trying to have to shoot in. To make things even worse, it's under the threshold of Sony camera's anti-flicker detection range, which is limited to 100 to 120 hertz. Now keep in mind that these lights are just on. They do not flicker or pulse or fade when you're looking at them in person with the naked eye. It's only the cameras that see these effects. So keeping expectations real, there's still no way we could expect to record 120p video when the lighting is flickering at just under 60 hertz. It, it's just impossible. We can't expect the global shutter to mitigate this. So in this situation, I mean, we would just switch to 24p and give up on any chance of getting any sort of slow motion video. Moving on to 24p with the a7c first, I mean, there's really no shutter speed that we can use to film in this type of lighting. Even going down to a 30th of a second, there's still some flickering and banding. So, I mean, just super challenging. When we move over to the A1, you can see we have some flickering and banding rolling throughout the frame, and it slowly improves until we fine tune the variable shutter to perfectly match the lighting phase. This takes a little bit of time and you know, you gotta mess around with the camera a little bit, but it's, it's super effective and it's definitely worth doing on a wedding day. Moving on to the A9 Mark III, this is where things get a bit more interesting. You can see that the global shutter is trading a faint band rolling throughout the frame for kind of more of a full frame flicker. If the variable shutter speed is not perfectly tuned, then you start to see the entire scene start to flicker. I tried using the flicker scan function several times, which is supposed to essentially detect the perfect shutter speed to eliminate the, the flickering, but I mean, it just doesn't seem to work here. So when we do end up dialing in the, the perfect variable shutter, uh, it, it's, it's essentially perfect. It's, it's just like the A1 and, uh, and that's what we would have to do in this situation. Now for stills photography in this worst case LED lighting scenario. So first of all, none of the cameras are able to detect the flicker rate, so none are able to effectively or reliably capture the lighting phase. The A1 really can't capture the entire lighting phase at any shutter speed faster than 1 60th of a second, and we end up with a mix of some lights on, some lights off in the same frame. And then when we switch to the A9 Mark III, I mean, the global shutter makes sure all the lights are caught at the same lighting phase, but it can't consistently catch the timing. So we have kind of major inconsistencies from shot to shot. So with this type of lighting, we really have two options. Use a shutter speed that's less than 1 60th of a second, or just overshoot. I mean, just shoot a ton more than you need, knowing that you're gonna have a lot of inconsistencies from shot to shot. So, I mean, in theory, if Sony's flicker detection rate wasn't limited to 100 to 120 hertz, then the A9 III technically would be able to shoot stills reliably in this scenario without any shutter speed issues. But, uh, I mean, we have to accept it just isn't possible right now. I don't know, maybe, maybe they could add it in a firmware update. Again, I do understand that the lights used here, they mimic the, really the worst case scenario, but I should mention that we do see this exact type of lighting at weddings from time to time. Moving on to more common, faster phase LED lighting. This type of lighting is really something that resembles more venue lighting that we're coming across these days. It's quite a bit more forgiving, but we still have to take caution with it. These lights are flickering at, I mean, just over 120 hertz, I, I believe, but with no official way to test that. So starting with the A7C at 24p, you can see there really is no shutter speed that completely mitigates the banding. We essentially have to drop down to 1 15th of a second, which I mean, it's completely unusable anyway. So for 24p video, when we move over to the A1, using standard shutter speeds, we're still seeing banding. 
but when we switch to variable shutter speeds, we end up having the best results at 133.7th of a second. Moving over to the A93, we can already see that things are looking much more forgiving with no banding whatsoever and just some faint flicker at various shutter speeds. When we enable variable shutter speeds and we start with the new TV flicker TV scan function, the camera lands on 180.1 of a second, which is crazy because 180th of a second wasn't really working as well. It also landed on 199th of a second uh, a couple of times and also on 133.7th of a second, which exact is exactly what the A1 uh, works perfectly at. For stills photography in this lighting, the A7C had banding issues even with the mechanical shutter at anything over about 1 80th of a second. And the faster the shutter speed, the more apparent the issues become. The A1 was fine if we stayed under that shutter speed threshold of 133.7th of a second. And it was fine with standard shutter speeds of up to 125th of a second. As soon as we went any faster though, we started to see banding and that only increased with faster shutter speeds. With the global shutter in the A9 Mark III, we can push the shutter speeds even further and we will never see any banding. Though I felt the best results were from 1 199th of a second, uh, I was happy shooting up to 250th of a second with this lighting. If we increase the shutter speed beyond that, we start to catch different phases of the lighting from shot to shot but that's still much preferable to banding. A stacked sensor with fast readout and variable shutter speeds is still great at handling some of the issues with lighting, but the global shutter really takes it all the way. So I want to thank Sony for lending me the A9 Mark III uh, to evaluate. And you know, it really did help answer a lot of my questions as far as the camera is concerned. If I were starting from scratch though, and I didn't have the A1, if I were looking between the two cameras, I think I would choose the A9 Mark III. Um, there was just so many refinements and just upgrades in the camera. It's really just taken aback by how well it works. And though I would miss that ability to crop in using the 50 megapixel sensor while I'm shooting and still have all that detail, I, I think it's worth the trade-offs as far as the ergonomics, the autofocus, and of course that global shutter are concerned. Anyways, thank you for watching and hey, let me know if I missed anything in the comments.